So we move uh, in this session, those of you with, with the last one, uh, from the hearts of darkness uh, to earthly paradise, as, as all things should move at the end of a day. Um, and we have a few uh, extraordinary panel uh, of different experts on Islamic gardens from very different worlds and very different perspectives. Uh, Philippa Vaughan, an archaeologist uh, who has dug wild garden and has uh, uh, specialised in a whole variety of Mughal gardens, uh, and Humayun's tomb, uh, worked on the extraordinary restorations that have taken place in both gardens uh, and bringing her expertise to the table. Uh, Marine teaches at SOAS uh, and uh, uh, is a Mughal art historian, bringing her uh, uh, specialism to the table, but also talking about the, the, use, the use of gardens and how they were, how they were used. Noor, uh, on home ground here, the, the boss upstairs in the... Uh, uh, in the uh, will be soon, I'm sure. Uh, in the, uh, in the uh, is, uh, uh, Oriental and, is, and uh, Indian sections, uh, speaking on uh, uh, the, sensorium, the sensorium. The sensorium of the of garden. Of the garden, yes. Uh, 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 Jürgen, uh, who is from our wonderful uh, and much-loved sponsor, the Aga Khan Foundation, which a big round of applause, please. <laughs> <laughs> Both for their work and for supporting us. Uh, and finally, uh, Tom uh, Stewart-Smith, who is uh, building a gardening, an Islamic garden in King's Cross, which is a uh, mm. first. And it's my wife's cousin, which is another <laughs> great cause for... <laughs> Uh, anyway, so, uh, Philippa, take it away. Uh, if you maybe speak for, for, for ten minutes on... on uh, yes, I'll just speak <laughs> maybe with the, the uh, slide. Could I? Take us back to the Persians. Where's, uh, the slide is here, is it? Oh, okay. So, oh, that's... Uh, I've gone on too far. You're making you work your neck muscles. Yes, yes. So, really, I was just going to try and set the scene. Both the notion of paradise... Uh, which, of course, everybody knows from the Quranic images of water, waterfalls, the purity of the water, the shade, the coolness, the, um, the rivers of milk, wine, water, and honey, and also of the cross-axial space. Um, Cross-axial space has almost become a cliche of the Islamic garden, so I just want to decouple that a bit. The cross-axial garden is found actually already in Parsagadi in the 6th century BCE, and also in the Sasanians in the uh, 6th century ACE. It's also in the Buddhist site of Sigiriya, which again is 6th century. But you do, of course, find it in the uh, Iraqi uh, uh, capital of uh, Rusara, uh, in the 8th century, and that is then transferred to Cordoba, uh, and also then into the uh, Tabriz and the lands of the Ilkhans and uh, Seljuks. In the Seljuk Isfahan, there are four great gardens mentioned in the sources. But the thing about this is that they are, they're mentioned as walled gardens, they're um, meadows, pools with uh, plots beside them, but there is no mention of the cross-axial. There are also hammams, so clearly there were extensive hydraulics. In the uh, gardens of Shari Sabs, which are visited by the Spanish ambassador in 1404, he describes many types of gardens, orchards, shade trees, meadows, pools with plots beside them, and then in one corner, what he calls a charbag, although we don't quite know what form that was. In any case, the sources in the 15th century, Timurid sources, which were a basis for Humayun's tomb subsequently, describe the charbag as essentially axial and not cross-axial. So I think we have to regard it as a feature of topography and something which is developed according to the circumstances and the needs and the, particularly the hydraulics. But what people imagine by uh, Persian garden or gardens is on the left, uh, Babur laying out a garden. Babur was a great PR person and the garden was an, a vital symbol of sovereignty because so the, the gardens in Timurid Iran and the dominions 
were used for men by preference over the citadels. They were used as living space. They were the center for ceremonies, uh, the circumcision ceremonies, any victory ceremonies, and of course the uh, Feast of Cups on the Thursday night, which was very important. Uh, on the left, here is Babur laying out a garden near Istalif in uh, Afghanistan. And you'll notice that there are plaster channels. The water is controlled, but it is white plaster, chunam. He then says when he gets to India, there are no decent, there are no gardens. It's an inhospitable country. Now, this actually is poetic license because Certainly, uh, Feroz Shah Tughluq had gardens in the 14th century. Uh, the area of Khumain's tomb was also a garden suburb prior to being laid out with the tomb. And also, the Sultan of uh, Gujarat had laid out a wonderful garden at Champaner by a horticulturalist from Herat, of whom Babur was almost certainly aware because he was very interested in gardens even when he was in Samarkand and Fergana. So this is just PR, if we can accept it as PR. But the important point about it is that these panels are chunam. Now on the, on the uh, right side are princes in a garden sharing uh, wine, just as the uh, Quranic images uh, propose. But I think that this garden, because you'll notice that there's some very interesting uh, work here and the type, is probably in Wa gardens. Now, Wa is an ex exceptional garden. It is the, a, a garden that has evolved according to need. And the need came into uh, the foreground when Akbar moved his capital from uh, Agra and Fatipur Sikri to Lahore in 1584 in order to focus on conquering the ancestral lands of Badakhshan. So they needed a staging post, which is why I've called it, when I've written about it, a Manzilbad, which means a staging post. be watered in this area. Now all this is quite different from the funereal architecture, dynastic architecture, which we usually associate with paradise gardens and with particularly with the Mughals. They did build many other, many other types of gardens as uh, Marine will show. <clears throat> but this was a symbol of sovereignty. And the visual realization of the metaphor of sovereignty was in scale, the monumental scale, and in the garden. So you get this uh, association in Humayun's tomb. Now, one of the most important things about it, actually, is if you can see on the left-hand side of the middle quadrant, I'm sorry there isn't a pointer. Um, well, you can't, but it's on a north-south axis this way there is the well. And one thing that you people usually forget to look for in gardens is the source of water. 
Here, in Homain's tomb, at the time it was built, it was, had the river <clears throat> frontage. But the pressure for the water, there was, there was no evidence of it being beyond the height of the uh, perimeter wall. <clears throat> and there is a, a well which has a sump of about a meter's drop. And this is really important for the uh, restoration of the fountains and the channels. There is no way that all these uh, channels and pools could ever have worked, except in the monsoon, they could never have worked. And it's an, a moot point as to how far they were there at all. Now, we did excavate, of course, and we couldn't find in many instances, but we did find <clears throat> in one area some of the white tunum. The, the merits of the white tunum is that it's non-porous. So this was really important. We also found a return system in the northwest quadrant by the, by the pool, uh, by, the, by the well, which returned within a small quadrant in order to feed the well. So it was clearly aware of water conservation. And it also went to a, a, a subsequent pool and down to the far end, which is at a much lower level. Because of the preoccupation uh, with Charbag, the different levels are often omitted. But it's a lower level. That is where the emperor and his court, in my view, uh, stayed when they, when they came. And they came at least nine times and circumambulated the tomb, again, as a sign of sovereignty. The sheer scale of uh, Human's tomb is uh, around 30 acres, but Akbar's tomb is actually 119 acres. So this has all sorts of implications for planting. And I would argue that the, the lawns and the meadows, I would, I would call them meadows, and also at Human's tomb, they're criticized for being lawns, but of course you've got to cut it. But in the, originally, I think they would have been uh, meadows. And here, the, um, the emphasis is both on scale and references to the mansions of paradise in the, and also the Great Gateway. The Great Gateway emphasizes the role, and it states in the inscription, the role of the emperor as Rizvan. And then, of course, the Taj, which is a different form altogether. It's at the end of the, it's on the waterfront. It's one of the characteristic waterfront gardens of Agra. And the, if you look at the map on the left, you'll notice beyond the perimeter wall are the hydraulic, the source of hydraulics, the enormous tanks and aqueduct which feeds the wonderful fountains which are run under natural pressure. Now there is now, uh, because this is so often ignored, there's now a Shiva temple on the entrance to the, uh, of the access to the river there which I think is actually slightly worrying. But in any case, these were spaces which were much used. The Urs, the death anniversary of Mumtaz, had uh, thousands of people from the court attending. Uh, initially, the first um, celebration was in the forecourt. The second celebration was actually on the plinth overlooking the river. Over a 1,000 people had their their uh, cushions and rugs laid out, and refreshments were served. And the women of the court came by the river, circumambulated the tomb. So these were actually not always quiet spaces, and I think one can overlay, uh, overemphasize that. They were important for ceremonial, and the paradisal metaphor was essential for Shah Jahan's uh, <coughs> self-presentation of sovereignty. It was a light motif, and at the end of the day, his, in Shah Jahanabad, the Nahar uh, Bahish, the uh, channel of paradise, in the court with the scales of justice, written above it is, if there's a paradise, it is here, it is here, it is here. So everything became a paradise. Could you just say, in case people don't know, the, the origin of the word paradise, the, what, what the English word? I, well, it's thought to be in Persian, paradiso via the Greek, yeah. it, but it, it means between four walls. It is a reference to a garden. No, not necessarily. No? What does it mean? No. Well, I don't, I, I'm not sure that. Uh, it means enclosed uh, place. Enclosed, enclosed place, place. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's what I think. Bruce? Enclosed hunting ground, mm. in, in, in Persian. 
<laughs> Marin. I'm going to move so I can see the screen. <laughs> That's all right. Um, can I sit here? Of course. Okay. <laughs> I do like my dear. <laughs> the worst thing will be if it collapses, but hopefully that won't be. No, it's very firm. <laughs> All right. Um, so my, what I um, thought would be a uh, good thing for me to do um, would be to talk a little bit about um, focusing in on the garden in the Mughal period and talking a bit about the functional use of the space. There's going to be a little bit of overlap with some of the spaces that Philippa was talking about and a few of the ideas, but hopefully um, not enough that lose interest, so I hope to maintain um, the interest here. So... Sound up. Sorry? Put the sound up. Is this... If you can't hear me, tell me and I'll just project more as well. Um, so, when we talk about um, gardens within a Mughal context, we have several types of gardens which are very frequently produced throughout the Mughal period. Um, we have gardens which were made for pleasurable purposes, gardens which were associated with funerary monuments, um, and uh, gardens associated with palatial residences, and, uh, and more. So I've got a series of images that I'll just go through and talk through with you um, and highlight certain points which I would like to based on the different images. So here we have um, a double page portrait of Babur laying out the Garden of Fidelity near Kabul. Um, as Philippa mentioned, there was a history of gardens being created in the region of South Asia prior to the Mughals coming. But when Babur came and founded the Mughal Empire, we do see um, from 1526 onwards, we do see a burst in garden activity and garden spaces being produced. And we know that from the um, landscape that Babur came from, from the Valley of Fergana, from Kabul, he'd already established a pattern of founding gardens, and it was something which persisted once he came into um, the region of South Asia, founding the Mughal Empire. And um, these were spaces that were very much architectural spaces as well. When we're talking about gardens within a Mughal context, it's not you know, gardens as we think of them today, just these green patches with flowers and, and plantings. Um, they were walled in spaces. They had complicated um, systems for the water channels, for the fountains to run. And we see that not only in the surviving examples, but in examples from miniature painting as well. Um, these were spaces where great court activities would take place. We have examples of um, gardens being used as um, places for audiences with the emperors. We have them being used for um, in more intimate gatherings. And we have examples like this, which illustrate one of the um, other uses of gardens, which is that they were places for prominent events in the lives of the royal family, in the lives of the princes as well. And so this is a painting um, which is representing the time of the circumcision of Akbar as a young prince. And the circumcision of the royal princes was a great event. It was a great festive occasion. And we have this wonderful representation here. And from the text, the historical text of the time, we know that this event took place in a garden in the region of Kabul. And so we have... Mayun is sitting just here. If there's feedback, let me know. Um, we have the baby Akbar just there with female attendants, and then the royal women of the court as well. So there was this kind of wide scale um, use of the space for these ceremonial activities. And having these types of uh, paintings produced, it's a really nice way for us to visualize the spaces um, as well. The these spaces as we see them today, um, quite a lot of the time, they're quite sterile. We've got the uh, pavilions, we've got the, um, the water channels. Sometimes there's water in them, sometimes there's not. But from the historical texts and from the miniature paintings as well, we really get the, the feel for how these spaces were used. They were living spaces. And so in this particular example, we have the Empress Noor Jahan, um, feasting Jahangir, her husband, and um, Prince Khurram, the future Shah Jahan, 
in a garden. And you can see that the uh, pavilions itself, themselves, they are quite highly decorated. Um, there are carpets which have been laid out throughout the gardens as well. We see the water running. We see the fountains, um, uh, the fountains spouting. Um, there are people, you know, attendants bringing wine and platters. And so these were very, um, very functional spaces. And these other types of activities took place here also. This is a garden that was um, initially built by Babur. Uh, this is in Agra, the um, Rambagh. Um, it was given to Noor Jahan after she married Jahangir, and she redid uh, the layout of the garden. She redid um, some of the constructions as well. And so here we have this um, space, which is on the riverbank. Um, it's a longitudinal garden. And the pavilions are there. They're, they're twinned with each other. And so, as I said, when we look at these today, they are these very, uh, I'm going to use that word again, sterile spaces. They're quite bare. Um, but we get a feel for what they looked like from paintings like the one I just showed you. And again, from the historical texts of the time, we know that when this particular garden was finished, um, when it was completed, Nur Jahan and Jahangir stayed here on their way into Agra. They stayed here for a period of days. We know that for some of the Nuru celebrations, they undertook activities here as well. Um, and they also sometimes would have audiences in this particular garden where they would give out robes of honor to members of the court. So it's these kind of examples, they're signifying to us, again, the functional use of the space. That it was used for ceremonial activity, it was used for New Year's celebration, and also as halting points. So as a place for them to stay, to kind of gather themselves to rest before the auspicious timing for them to enter into Agra. This is uh, the Shalimar Gardens in Lahore. Um, and I wanted to highlight, um, use this garden and the next example as well, to just highlight the idea of the of the space, of the way that these gardens were created. Um, the funerary gardens, the, the garden I just showed you, um, they are flat gardens. But one of the um, types of gardens which was made in the Mughal period as well were terraced gardens. And so they were built on different levels. And they ranged at times from three levels up to eight or nine levels. And one of the things we have to consider when these types of gardens are being created is, again, how, um, how impressive the engineering has to be, how complicated the hydraulic system has to be. Because you're moving water from different levels. You know, it's dropping down. It's rising back up again. You need the pressure for the fountains on each level to um, work and for the water to circulate. And one of the other reasons I wanted to highlight the Shalimar Gardens um, here is to bring to um, attention the fact that these gardens became livable spaces. And when they were constructed, it was with the idea that people could stay there in mind. Uh, because we know once the Shalimar Gardens in Lahore was finished, whenever Shah Jahan would come through Lahore after that, he didn't stay at the fort. He would stay here. This was his um, preferable. And we know that um, quarters were built for him, quarters were built for the queen. There was a hammam constructed here as well. So it was a space that was meant to be used and for people to stay in. So the views that we're seeing here on the left-hand side, um, this is taken from the top terrace looking down. And the middle terrace is what you see on the right. It was this elaborate water tank with fountains completely encircling it and a platform in the middle where musicians could sit um, and play. In the, the front, on the left-hand side of the picture, you see a, a pedestal throne, um, which could be utilized by the ruler as well. And this is just the plan of this particular garden. So you can see that it was done on three terraces. On the left-hand side is the top terrace, then it drops to the middle terrace, and then it drops to the lower terrace. And here, you get a sense of that drop, um, especially from the image on the bottom right. You see that drop down from the first garden, and then the drop down uh, from the second garden as well.
And then this is the hammam, which was constructed um, in the Shalimar Gardens. So this is the entrance is on the middle terrace. It occupies um, one quadrant, and it's a, a, a typical hammam. It's got the hot rooms, the cold rooms, the warm rooms. And it was, um, I think, in 2011, they were just finishing up the uh, restoration of this particular space. And then the last um, garden that I wanted to, to show you is another of these terraced gardens. Um, so this is the Nishath Bagh in Srinagar, um, built, around, uh, built on the banks of Dal Lake. And um, this is exemplifying not only, again, this idea of the, the, the terraced garden as being a popular type that the Mughals um, enjoyed, but one of the things which um, we, we should remember as well when these gardens are being constructed is the taking into account the landscape within which they are being created. And so examples like the gardens in Srinagar, because many were built around Dalek by the Mughals, um, they really took advantage of this incredible backdrop of the mountains and then the, um, the, the, the leveling off of the region as well. So the Nishat Bagh has Eight, eight or nine um, terraces. And you can see um, on the left-hand side, um, it is going back towards the <laughs> topmost level. And then on the right-hand side, you can see it dropping down, ultimately exiting into the lake. And this is quite an extensive compound. It's a longitudinal one, again. Um, and you can see how the, uh, the layout of the garden takes Account, takes into account the surrounding landscape and how it really benefits from it. So here's some features of this particular garden just to give you an idea again of that terraced effect and how the water would be moving through these spaces. So the, um, the, this kind of drop down that you see on the right hand side where the water splashes down and enters into the channels. So this is, um, it was called a chador. Um, and many of them, I mean, they were built on every single terrace to help the water, um, not to help the water, but to beautify the water as it was coming down. It was a way of making it an even more aesthetic experience. And then you can see the fountain spouts. They lined the entire um, water channel. And so what I'm showing you on the right-hand side is the central channel through straight do down the uh, center of the garden. But if you look on the bottom left-hand side, you can see that to either side then, there were plants, there were um, uh, more landscaped areas um, which were constructed as well. And then the drop-down is a more straight, uh, straight drop in terms of just terraces being constructed. And then um, the, the final uh, kind of points I wanted to, to talk about was the idea of the garden as paradise, and specifically in relation to the Mughal funerary tombs, um, which Philippa has mentioned, so I'll just spend a little bit of time on this. Um, there is a very strong correlation, particularly in the Mughal period, of trying to make an equation between the funerary gardens and the Quranic gardens of paradise. And it's not just being done in a symbolic way. Sometimes it's being done in very overt ways. And so there were two particular examples I just wanted to share with you about that. And one of them is the garden in Sikandra, which, um, uh, which is where Akbar's mausoleum was located. And so this is the gateway into that garden. And there are Quranic verses on the gateway, and so and these are on the exterior of the gateway, which talk about how paradise is for the believer. And so if you believe in, um, in the afterlife, you will be able to enter paradise. And this is a plan of the garden with the tomb in the very center. Now, today we call this city, this town, Sikandra, its name. But when um, Akbar passed away, when his mausoleum was built here, it's referred to as Behishtabad which is the city of paradise. So there was an actual um, nominal association of this space now where we have a funerary monument and a funerary garden with paradise. And then the most, I think, overt and probably most famous example of this equation of the funerary gardens with the gardens of paradise is at the Taj Mahal, 
where we have Quranic inscriptions on the entrance gate leading into the funerary garden, which are actually extolling the believer to enter into the gardens of paradise. So there's this symbolic equation then with the idea that as you walk through this gateway, you're entering into the paradisical gardens, but on earth. And it ties into uh, a more symbolic association with the building that there's no time to get into, but which equates the Taj Mahal as being a paradisical house for Mumtaz Mahal here on earth, representing her paradisical house in, um, in heaven. That's it for me. We're perfect. <laughs> How much time should we have more yeah, than enough time? Okay, brilliant. I'll also become peripatetic um, for my presentation so that I can see. Oh, and I'm going to go wherever you like now. Okay. Um, I'll wander, I'll wander amidst the audience. Um, okay. Oh, okay, brilliant. Yes, exactly. Peripatetic, precisely. So, um, just to introduce myself, William gave me a very generous introduction that I'm not actually the head of the Oriental Manuscripts Division at the British Library. I'm merely responsible for the um, South Asian material in Perso-Arabic script, which largely translates to Urdu. Um, and so I was flattered, uh, but a bit puzzled when I was asked <laughs> to be part of this panel because I don't work on gardens or, or Mughal gardens. So I thought, what could I possibly talk about that might be relevant? Um, so we have, amongst our Dakni Urdu manuscripts in the collection, uh, a manuscript by the title of the Pulban, the flower garden. And it uh, contains um, many illustrations that are beautifully evocative of the sensorium of the garden of the Deccan. So I thought that perhaps providing some insight into the aesthetics of the garden, the lived uh, senses of it, like how would it have smelt and felt, what would it have sounded like? Because we have some very beautiful um, visual evocations of the ephemeral sense world of the garden in this particular manuscript. And I also thought um, I can show you some beautiful pictures you might not notice that I don't know that much about Mughal gardens. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is uh, the Pulban. Again, the British Library has a very rich collection of Dakni Urdu manuscripts, probably the, the second richest after, say, the Salar Jung in, in Hyderabad. Um, and this work in particular has been studied by Sunil Sharma, whose work I'm drawing on today. I highly recommend his research. He's a scholar of Indo-Persian. Um, this is in Dakni Urdu, but it was translated in the middle of the 17th century from Persian into Urdu. And it was originally written in prose, and now it's been versified in Urdu. And so you have a very nice, um, and here I'll become even more peripatetic. Tell me if you uh, can see me. So we have a picture of the, of the poet himself sitting and writing in, uh, enclosed in a garden where you have the natural world sort of encroaching on his experience of writing the pulban, of actually writing the flower garden itself. Um, and then you also have several pages, two, in fact, portraits of um, the uh, Shah Abdullah of Golconda, who is the patron of the manuscript, depicted in his garden, smelling a rose. So we, of course, I mean, this is the, the, the classic way that sovereigns are depicted to give a sense of their refinement. But of course, it fits in very nicely with the theme of gardens because you have an evocation of the scent of the flowers and that the appreciation of the scent of the flowers and the appreciation of the, the manuscript itself as the pulban, as the flower garden, um, is clearly being evoked in this particular portrait. So what does the, the manuscript discuss? What does it talk about? It's actually quite a convoluted tale of adventure. Um, the first half of it is a series of interlocking stories um, that sort of revolve around fabulous tales involving the king of Kashmir, of Sindh, of Egypt, of all manner of royalty, princes, princesses, fairies, dervishes, yogis, sometimes royalty described as, or d disguised as yogis, wandering in and out of nature and palaces and traveling across the world. So that's the first half. The second half of the story is uh, the tale of two star-crossed lovers. And it's a very complex and convoluted plot. And I'll take you through some of the images here. And gardens and nature feature quite uh, prominently, actually, in the story, uh, as the name of the manuscript would suggest. So basically, you have uh, a tale of love, separation, and reunion, the classic sort of Sufi metaphor of the, the love story in this period, um, between the Egyptian prince and uh, an Iranian princess or a princess of Ajam. So you can you know, understand that how you will. Could be anywhere non-Arabic speaking, basically. So they elope and live in hiding. And I think the next one should have an image of them. Yes, so they elope and live in hiding uh, until one day when 
the princess is sitting in her garden, drying her hair by the window, and um, she's spotted by the king of India, who then kidnaps her. Um, and so he, the king of India conspires to have her love, who is this prince of Egypt, drowned. Um, however, of course, the princess spurns her, the, the, the king of India. Then later on in the story, it's discovered that the prince didn't die at all. He's being held captive by fairies, as happens. I mean, we all, that's happened to all of us. Um, so she then goes and she disguises herself as a female mendicant and wanders in the wilderness until she manages to locate him. Again, a common trope in this sort of story, the period of moving out of the orderly space of the palace garden into the wilderness where one wanders as, an, as, uh, as a mendicant while searching for one's love. Um, she then locates him and they live happily ever after back in the orderly space of the Charbagh uh, garden, which you've seen, I'm sure, many pictures of in the first. I couldn't see your presentations, but I assume they have a picture <laughs> of a Charbagh in them. Um, so the point of telling you this story and, and showing you these images um, is to provide some insight, literary insight perhaps, into how the spaces of the uncultivated nature versus the cultivated palace garden, the very heavily cultivated palace garden with its you know, night blooming flowers that were particularly chosen because of a particular scent that they would give at a particular time when a particular type of music would be played, um, you know, as opposed to the, 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 the wilderness where one wanders when one is separated from one's love. Um, you know, and the spaces are used in this work to indicate transgression. Um, I don't think I have this picture here, but there's a beautiful nighttime scene where the prince and princess meet at night when everyone is actually sleeping in the garden. So you have the servants sort of wrapped up in blankets in the garden sleeping and the prince and princess are sort of, you know, talking in the corner at night, you know, as the, as the nature sort of encroaches upon them. Um, so again, it's a beautiful evocation of, of uh, the, the sort of conflating the emotions with the beauty of nature. Um, so the space of the garden, I would say, beyond the metaphor of paradise, carries with it a range of spiritual and worldly meanings. Uh, both in the literary sense and, and perhaps also in the, in the courtly sense as well. The two of you would know much better than I do. Um, but in the literary sense, at least, these, this range of meanings are illustrated in the text. So this sort of chaos, separation, and transgression of the wilderness versus the order and union of the space of the palace garden. So just to, I wanted to basically uh, give you some illustrations of the vis how the visual aesthetic of the garden calls to your attention the actual sensorium of the Deccan garden space and by extension the Mughal garden. So again, the way that the trees and flowers infringe on the ordered space of the palace. Uh, do we have a picture of that? Well, you have a bit of infringement here, but more when the scribe is writing. Um, so how the, the, um, the flowers peek through the windows of, of several court scenes evoking the stirrings of desire. And, um, and the stirrings of scent, you know, how the, how the sovereign is shown smelling a flower and appreciating the scentscape of his garden and court. So, and to me, the, the evocation of the stirrings of scent are, uh, or the, the depiction of the stirring of scent is also evocative of the stirring of desire that the two main characters experience in the story. So the garden isn't just used as a visual metaphor of space, but also of emotion and passion and its disruptive power within the space of the garden. So basically, I just wanted to highlight the importance of the garden and images of the garden in manuscripts to the study of aesthetics, Islamic aesthetics, Deccan, Mughal aesthetics, beyond purely the visual, um, taking into account the ephemeral sensecapes, taste, sound, um, that would have been an integral part of the garden, and also show how the visual and poetic evocations of the garden can provide us some insight into both the spiritual as well as the profane emotions that the garden was meant to, to evoke in, uh, in the dweller of the garden. <laughs> So that's it from me. <laughs> I um, is it on or not? Yeah. I'll follow your example and stand over there. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't see your slides. No, no, quite a small number, but I can send them to you. They're actually it's been digitized. Oh, I should mention that it's on my. This is digitized online, so if anyone wants to see it. <laughs> Being a bit later in the presentation has an advantage. I can speed up certain uh, slides because I don't want to repeat things that others already have, have explained in detail. But this is just an overview of the nine parks that we've created to the past 15 years. I would like to think of all of them being gardens of paradise. Of course, that's not true, strictly speaking, because only a few are historic. Many of them are new, but a lot of the features of gardens of paradise are incorporated. Um, and the ones that are truly important from a historic perspective is Bari Babur, that's already mentioned. 
Sundar Nursery, which is directly next to, um, to um, Humayun's tomb in Delhi and in the South Kutub Shai. How do I get this further? Can someone tell me how, to, how this works? Right, press right. Press right? You, all right. Um, I just skipped over one slide. That, that helps. Um, Humayun's tomb we talked about. What is interesting is that right next to Humayun's tomb was a wasteland called the Sunda Nursery, a low sort of intense, intensity nursery created during the British Raj that produced flowers, but was still of Mughal area monuments. In order to make sure that we would not destroy any of the features within Humayun's tomb in order to accommodate for the requirements of the people, we found a good spot close by where that the amenities that are necessary for parks that cater for large numbers of people could be brought in. And that's done in the Sunda Nursery, as you see right here. Currently, there's a museum being built south of Sunda Nursery that links it up with the site just in front of Humayun's tomb, and that will be um, open within two years. The features, here you see Humayun's tomb itself, the features and water <laughs> around it have been mentioned. It's one of the important elements of the Islamic uh, gardens. The same has been copied here. This is brand new, but it gives more prominent, prominence to the monuments that one finds in the, in the Sunda nursery. As you can see here, water is again one of the features, including the chadar that was earlier mentioned, that gives the, the white um, froth, if you like, when the water runs over it. Um, this is an example of the new Islamic garden, which is built in Edmonton, in the north of Canada, and it's about to be completed. It will be opened later during this year. It still shows a lot of the features, although this is in a total, total new park in a total different setting. Bahri Babur, this is the situation as we found it in 2002, uh, with the area around it completely depopulated. The area, the, the park itself was full of unexploded ordnance. Uh, there was a, an old swimming pool created by the Soviets. We restored it over time, and then brought the central waterway in there back. There was earlier mention about terraces. Here there are seven up to the pavilion. There's another two terraces up into the grave of Babur at the far end. At the far end. Here you can see that. This is a reservoir. The old pool that was here had to be recreated because of demand from the population. It's one of the odd places where I really constructed a swimming pool that's really popular. Now it's right there. <laughs> Um, there's also a caravan sarai, and one of the things that all the parks have is <clears throat> they show all of the parks that we have, they have um, um, a place where an amphitheater or a place where events can take place. And certainly for historic uh, gardens, it's difficult to find an environment where you can do that. Um, other than water, the parks, of course, have always this incredible contrast with the immediate surroundings. In this case, in Cairo, you can see this is the al Azhar Park being created. Again, it's not a paradise garden <laughs> in the strict original sense, but certainly it's a garden that's right next to the historic center of the city. Um, and it's built on a, a garbage belt. This was 500 years of garbage dumped across the wall over a length of one and a half kilometers, a width of 500 meters, where over the course of eight years, we constructed a park and that's what the park looks like right now. So here again, you see the contrast with the big metropolis. The park, with a lot of the features, the central waterway again, <clears throat> also coming from the top, and a lake where all the water comes together that also doubles as a reservoir in case that the pumping system doesn't work, because in this case, you have to irrigate each and every day. Now, there's another element to parks and to historic gardens that is a bit different from the way we see the parks today because we have to cater for a large public, and that is the fact that in the past they were exclusive. They were for the <coughs> privileged few that could go and have access to these gardens. They were secured. And if you look at this picture, which is um, our latest project in which we work in the uh, fort of Lahore, and you see the same examples of the Chalbag that had been mentioned before in the Hazuri Bag, which is just outside the fort, and the different quadrangles this one from the period of Jahangir, this from Shah Jahan. This was altered during the Sikh period. And then the, mic, the big Maidan, where all the public events were held. This being the private part, this being the more public part within, within the fort. It looks wonderful from above. But if you look at ground level, you see that all the sense of intimacy is gone, because the walls are no longer there. 
and large numbers of people come and visit this, and this creates a dilemma. How do you make this visible? If one looks at the example of the Alhambra, when I visited it, I had to order tickets three months in advance. This may be a solution. If you really want to see these things, you can't come there with two or 300 people at the same time. It will spoil everything. There's a lot of noise. People spoil things, the graffiti on the walls, all of these things happen. Here we're currently working on ideas on how to bring back this level of intimacy, and that's not, not easy, because obviously when you restore, you cannot build things that you not for sure know were not there before. So you cannot have an imaginary wall or something like that. So this causes a dilemma, and this is something we're still discussing. This is a major project, and a very expensive one. All in all, it will take five years and probably at the cost of $50 million to restore this the entire fort, which we're not the only players in the field, but we have an important role in creating a master plan for this. So this issue, I think the water, the contrast, and then of course the exclusivity versus the inclusivity that people want nowadays are major issues that we talk about. I mentioned earlier that all of the parks that we have these are the different amenities you can find. It's very small, I'm sure you can't see it from there. It's not important, but I said all of the parks have an amphitheater, all of them have kiosks, and all have exhibition space. That's the thing that they always share in common. Because that's where the functions of the parks are. In the case of Kabul, it's the most pronounced is the safety. In a city where there are daily bombings, it's wonderful to have a place where you know and that nothing can happen. This park has been operating for 12 years now, and there's been not a single incident. There's been one attempt suicide attack which was stopped 50 meters before that happened. And that's a relief for the people who come and visit. So security being one. Education is another point. This is Humayun's tomb. You see large numbers of school children coming. All of the parks we have have large, large numbers of visitors from schools. Then there's the events, education, but events that take place. This is the caravanserai at the bottom of the, of, um, uh, the Baribabur where a concert takes place, there are plays, all of these things happen in the parks that you run nowadays. And then there is, of course, this other element that is called family togetherness or social bonding. It's a key element for a park. It's also a backdrop of romance. Many people, young couples that really want to get the, on the, away from the gaze of their parents, find their way through parks, and why not? It's a really good thing. <laughs> um, it's an important function of the park, and we should recognize that. Now, the idea is, you're in a park, you can feel king for one hour, two hours, but afterwards you go back to your regular surroundings again. So it is this idea, you have paradise on earth, but you know, you've got to leave this paradise again. So what do you do? <clears throat> in this case, in Cairo, you have the city of the dead to the south. This is the largest cemetery in the world. It continues for kilometers and kilometers. Nothing much to be done there, only very few people live there. But to the north is a vibrant neighborhood of 100,000 people. And what we do, because all of the parks are gated, and all of the parks charge a small entry fee for maintenance and also for security, which is something people really like. We have a small surplus, and we use that for activities within the neighborhood in order to make sure that people take a little piece of paradise with them to their neighborhood. So this is an example of a little square opposite the mosque in that neighborhood, which for relatively little money, look at that tree, how badly it was pruned. We transformed, tree is still there, but we put obstacles for vehicles and gave a facelift to the buildings around it. We did the shops and built a cafeteria on top where foreigners can come and feel at, feel at ease. Housing, right at the edge of the park. It's never nice to look at ruins when you're in a park. It's also nice for the people living in their ruins. The house gets improved. That's why we worked. We did Kabul <coughs> outside the park, a steep area with all the houses on the hill, street paving, and sewers that were constructed. And then lastly, maybe it's one more thing that we look at more recently. This is a satellite image around the area of the car park in Cairo, where we had through a number of screens could work out the number of canopies of green space in the neighborhood. This was taken roughly six years after the park had been operation. For us, that's a baseline. We now start measuring in the future whether there's additional greenery in the neighborhood as a result of what the people experience in the park. And with that, I want to leave it. Thank you, Jürgen. <laughs> so, <laughs> We've got about seven minutes. Seven minutes? Uh, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go for the central position. Um, <laughs> I think I'm going to block out. Otherwise, I, otherwise I block out the... Uh, <laughs> right. Um, Jürgen's work is incredible. I, m mine, mine is... Uh, 
<laughs> very <laughs> modest in scale by comparison. Um, and it's also, we're, we're now going to move, you have to sort of move your gaze about 3,000 miles west into Morocco. Um, I was approached about four years ago by an Italian who went to have his teeth done in a dentist in Harley Street. It seems to be how half my work happens. So I'm a <laughs> practitioner, not a scholar. You've had, all the, you've had the scholarly bit, now the practice. Gardens, not dentistry. <laughs> 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 exactly. So anyway, so he, um, he rang me up and said, look, I, I, we, I've come into the ownership of this extraordinary site in Marrakesh. Would you, would you like to meet me? And uh, the, these, these slides have, have, um, have got rather jumbled up, I think, because we're starting with my proposal. And there's a little bit before where I would show you what the site was like. Um, and he showed me on his mobile phone a, a picture of a sort of derelict wasteland, um, which apparently was in the middle of Marrakesh. I knew Marrakesh well enough to know that there are no derelict wastelands in the middle of the city. So this one had to be something pretty extraordinary. And I went there, and, um, and it was exactly as it was on the, on the mobile phone. It was an acre of land. Uh, about 200 yards from Ma El Fna. I still can't pronounce it, although I've been going to Marrakech for about five years now, four years. Um, and it was very near one of the main mosques in the city, the Mosque Moussin. And uh, it transpired that this site was, a, was indeed a garden divided into two courtyards, and it was owned by the chancellor to the last sultan before the French protectorate in, in 1912. He was a man called Lucrisi, and he had five wives, um, all of them Nubian um, slaves. And, um, and so when he died, he had rather a lot of children. When my client, who's an Italian businessman, started to buy this site about 10 years ago, um, there were 151 different people owning the site. <laughs> um, he, had, he had delusions about building a hotel there. Um, but by the time he managed to buy the last um, little slice of land, which was about the size of this carpet, um, the moment for building hotels in Marrakesh had gone. And he looked over the fence at the garden many of you may have visited, the, the Yves Saint Laurent garden um, just outside the city, and thought, well, I wouldn't mind a little bit of that cake. Um, so he, he had the idea of making a garden. And of course, it was very appropriate because it had been a garden before. 